I'm building a greenhouse attached to my back porch. The framing and roof are both done. Now it's time to dig trenches inside of it. But this greenhouse is unique. It's going to use sub-irrigated planters to recycle gray water from my kitchen. That means it won't increase the water bill, or in my case, water use. It's even more unique because it's going to heat itself on the coldest nights using a geothermal system. And as a fallback, it's connected to a rocket mass heater on my back porch. In this video, I'm going to show you how to turn all this into a geothermal irrigation system. These things are called distribution boxes. They come with a female end that I took the time to cut in four different places, and then I used a heat gun to fold it over on itself when the plastic was pliable. Then I cool it with water to hold its shape. I used a hole saw to open up these ports. Then I point the open ports at each other and I'm going to connect them with four inch corrugated drain pipe. I bought the stuff that's perforated because I want it to be able to wick water out of the system. To make sure that roots don't grow into the slits and clog everything up, I bought some specialty sock or sleeve. But before I put in the drain pipe, it's important to put in some geotextile fabric. That's because in the process of digging this trench, I came across some stone that I had to break up and it led to some pretty sharp edges that would cut pond liner. You don't want that because then the whole thing would leak. This is that geotextile fabric. I use specialty staples to hold the fabric in place inside the trench. Then I use my favorite shears to cut the pond liner. I use the bigger piece later in the video for another in-ground planter. With the pond liner in place, I connected my drainage components to each other. This forms the underground manifold that both waters and heats the greenhouse. These tubes click in place like Legos. I backfilled this trench with the exact dirt I took out of it. I started at the ends to force all the joints tighter together rather than risk stretching them apart. Then I added some water to help the soil settle into place. So I dug a ditch all the way around the perimeter of this planter. A competent pond installer might call this an anchor trench or anchor shelf. The concept is that you're supposed to have a shelf of dirt and then a drop, a sideways trench, and then a lip up for the pond liner to kind of flop into and zigzag around. Then when you pile either gravel or dirt into this area, that weight locks the pond liner in place so that over time, if you were to add weight or push down, it can't be pulled in very easily anyway. After I trimmed down the pond liner, I backfilled my anchor trench. Here's the same boom lift from part one of this build. I used it to frame the roof of this greenhouse. I needed to move some steel with the front loader, so I put the boom lift into high-tech storage. This is the last piece of leftover steel from the retaining wall I built for my water tank. I wanted to make a cactus planter right up against one of the walls of the greenhouse, and I wanted that rusty metal look. These are cheap Harbor Freight squares I've used for years. Recently I committed to buying a high quality square. Check out the link to Fireball Tools in the description. I've started to use their tools more and more and they are well worth the coin.
Priority number one for this planter was to be a geothermal heater. All I have to do is put a corrugated pipe into the distribution box from up top. A short one will go here and a long one will go here that goes all the way up to almost touch the ceiling. Then I'm gonna use a duct fan like this one and connect it to this tube to blow the hot air from the ceiling down through this tube and underground. During the winter, I'll run this fan all day long to heat the soil all day long. Then when the winter nights come, I'll keep the fan blowing and the hot air will come out of this tube and heat the air inside the greenhouse so the plants never get too cold. All the remaining planters will use a similar duct system to act as a geothermal heater, but they will also be optimized for sub-irrigation by adding a layer of sand at the bottom. The sand layer at the bottom will allow water to move freely through the particles without any risk of clogging with clay. I'll also place a layer of geotextile fabric on top of that sand so that there's something between the sand and the soil to prevent them from mixing. I slope this planter so that the high point is at the center and it slopes down to the edges so I can evacuate the water if I need to. For this next planter, I'm gonna make the slope slightly different. There's gonna be an obvious high point at this side. That's because I'm gonna use this planter as a filter for the kitchen gray water behind me. The water's gonna flow in here at the center of this planter. The water will then percolate through the soil, down through the sand, enter the tubes, and flow downhill to this point. From here, I can pump that filtered water back up, put it in some sort of a reservoir, or water the other planters directly using the sub-irrigation system, or for the cactus planter, water it from the top. That means that this planter is going to serve as a water filter, a geothermal heater, a sub-irrigation system, and a worm farm because there's going to be small amounts of food particles in the water that comes in here. I have no idea if this is going to work, but we'll find out. These are Y connectors to make a larger manifold design that I use for all the remaining planters. They have tabs to hold the 4 inch drain pipe in place. Now there are 6 tubes in each manifold. The larger surface contact with the soil allows for more heat exchange. That'll make more sense later. I buried the lower three tubes in pure sand. Then I bought some 6 inch corrugated drain pipe. This stuff is not perforated like the smaller 4 inch pipe was. The bigger pipes serve as the chimney for each distribution box. I used plastic rivets to hold the chimneys in place. Once both chimneys were installed, I put a layer of geotextile fabric on top of the sand. This should help prevent the soil and sand from mixing. Then I made a 1-1-3 mixture of perlite sand and the soil I dug out of the trench. Perlite produces a great deal of dust. The two ways to combat that are a respirator or adding water to the perlite. I went with the second option. Then I backfilled the remainder of the trench with this mixture. While doing so, I chatted with an AI about microplastics and planters like these. I'll put a link on screen if you're into that sort of thing.
I trimmed off the excess pond liner and used the leftover soil to level the floor of the greenhouse. The cactus planter was filled with the same components but a 1 1 1 ratio. I trimmed the liner and installed the chimneys here. Then I used a vibratory plate compactor to stabilize the soil. Now that I was ready to build the two raised planters, I used backer board to serve as a foundation for each one. By now, I was fully addicted to these squares and I bought four of them. As I welded the planter frames, I fine-tuned their level using sand under the backer board. These double uprights on the corner will make more sense once you see how I build the walls of the planters. These straps prevent the tops of the planters from spreading apart over time due to outward soil pressure. I drilled a hole in the middle of the two vertical supports on the ends. This allowed me to skewer the entire planter with some scrap tube steel, which in turn allowed me to move the planter easily. That way I could drill weep holes at the bottom of each horizontal surface. This rotisserie setup also allowed me to weld each joint easily and to prep and paint the entire frame in one go. I used 16 gauge sheet steel to make the end walls for the planter. I tried something new to get the rust off. I used a DC battery charger and washing soda to set up electrolysis. It wound up taking much longer than it was worth, but the bubbles were so hypnotizing I just had to include it. Twelve hours later. After painting them, I drilled a hole that lined up with the holes in the verticals. Then I used toggle bolts to fasten the end panels to the end verticals. God willing, this grommet will prevent my kids from filling these tubes with Legos. This is the 16 gauge steel I made the ends out of. This is the steel I'm going to use for the long walls. It's paper thin, which means it needs ribs to reinforce it. Lucky for me, I live in a city that has a steel yard capable of rolling this stuff to custom lengths. This giant machine uses a series of rollers to turn the floppy sheet steel into rigid panels often called R-panels. Like a giant Play-Doh machine, you cut it on its way out. R-panels have an edge like this on both sides of the panel. 
What I got is technically PBR panel, which means Perlin bearing rib, and it extends from here where the R panel normally stops all the way down to here. This flat edge is required to sit against the top of the planner frame. I cut the R panel edge off the sheet so the bottom sits flush against the frame just like the top does. I notch the sheets so they sit all the way down against the backer board foundation. Then I installed self-tapping screws into the vertical supports. I built a slightly less long planter next to the first one. With both planters done, I used HVAC tape to prevent the screw heads from snagging the pond liner. For the corners, I used strips of geotextile fabric to be sure the PBR panel edges were covered. I also covered the rough floor with geotextile fabric. After pulling the pond liner into place, I got to practice my pastry folding skills on the corners. Then I filled the bottom with a few inches of sand so the manifold wouldn't grind against the horizontal supports crossing under the tubes. Once again, I buried the lower tubes in sand. Here again, I used plastic rivets to install the chimneys. Because there won't be any tree roots inside the raised planters, I decided to skip the geotextile fabric between the sand and the soil. I filled these planters with a similar 113 mixture as before. I bought a high quality garden soil since I ran out of native soil for my yard. I learned enough from my little AI chat to avoid any soil containing biosolids. That will make more sense if you go listen to it. I used a heat gun to make the chimneys truly plumb. Then I installed the top straps. The walls had already sagged away from each other just a little bit, so I used giant clamps to help me install them. Before erecting the walls of the greenhouse, thus locking these planters inside of it, first I want to make sure they actually work. These tubes have two jobs to perform. The first is to deliver an ideal mixture of moisture and air to the root zone of each planter. After partially filling the horizontal tubes, that moisture wicks up through the soil and hydrates the plants. Since the tubes are never completely full, they also provide enough airflow to avoid root rot. This type of system is often called a wicking bed or a sub-irrigated planter, and it's a hyper-efficient way of keeping plants watered while also avoiding surface evaporation in dry climates like mine. Speaking of growing things in dry climates, check out my interview with Sean Overton. He's growing a forest in the driest desert in Texas. Link up here and in the description. The second purpose of these tubes is geothermal heating but they can't do that while they're full of water. So during our coldest months, I'll lower a pump into the distribution box to evacuate the water. The soil itself will retain enough moisture to keep the plants happy, and with the water pumped out of the tubes, I can use duct fans to blow air through them, and that will store excess daytime heat in the soil where it can then be released later that night. Now that I know these planters work, I'm going to build the walls and enclose the greenhouse. If you want to see that, follow along. I'll see you all in the next one.